Yeah, readings, Earthlings, and welcome back to another episode of League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with all of you beauties as we hope you slept well. We hope T1 slept well. It seems like they did right back onto the rift for the most hyped up, evenly matched marquee telecom war era that we have ever had and may ever have again. Rarely does the telecom war disappoint and rarely does the telecom war disappoint in playoffs even more so than that regular type of matchup that we get. You better believe that they got their sleep because you were up all night for a long five game series. The full Bonanza silver scrapes between T1 and KT Rolster. And we'll go backwards on this one starting with that decisive game five. You already see, you already know. Mark's got the hoodie on, which means there was a little bit of a clutch factor in that fifth game. Two key moments for me to talk about. The first comes from this big dragon fight. You've got aiming on the Draven in this game, and he dies in this fight before he's able to cash in, so loses all these stacks, but he is 20 HP. His last auto attack before he dies from picking up a kill. I'm not saying this changes the entire outlook of this game, but there are team fights later where he just can't break through the health of Zeus. If he has an extra thousand plus gold, maybe he's killing Zeus a bit faster. Maybe a team fight's completely different. It's certainly a key moment when you look back and as you as you laid out when you think about later on in this game and you're looking for that extra damage, you're looking for that ramp up. If you get this cash in, which would have been a relatively considerable cash yeah, in 20 minutes this into the game, game at this point would have been a big boost in power boost in gold boost in that damage for this kt rolster side absolutely i'm looking at this one as a key moment that doesn't go the way for this kt team because you have that damage you have that draven being a threat i think a couple of these later game engages do look different if you are kt rolster doesn't go that way and then we get into that opportunity that paints the picture for mr kiria to make the play of the series yeah that's the other obvious key moment is this rel disengage slash engage that saves owner's life and potentially kt gets that pick on owner they're probably looking at a baron and again that's maybe game five going their way Oh man, you see one super sad and super disappointed Tristana from BDD trying to make that hop over to pick up that kill and start Reset City. Ain't gonna happen on Curious Watch. He makes the amazing Magnet Storm drop down, makes that play, makes sure that owner is safe and T1 turn it around to pick up some advantages for themselves. And from that point on, it was T1's game to lose. Yeah, it ends up being an ace on the other side of the map as uh, Faker and Zeus do clean that up. But uh, close contested fifth game. I'm shocked we even got to that fifth game because I mean, this series was a KT roller coaster. In a nutshell, you have this fantastic game one where they completely smash T1 and you look like, yeah, this is the top seed from the regular season. T1 bounces back, steals all the momentum in the series for two straight games, and somehow KT bounces back for a dominant game four to even force that game five. But Mark, we are two weeks to the day, July 27th. T1 was losing to DRX in game three, and now here they are taking down the 17 and one KT in a best of five. What a turnaround. And it's not as simple as just going, it's Faker playing in the mid lane. It's the Faker playing in the mid lane with the Faker effect for the other four members of this T1 team. Because again, in this series, you don't get across this finish line. You cannot beat KT Rolster without the other four members of this team playing to that potential that we have seen them play to before. And what is that secret? What is the difference? Why it was gone? Faker seems to be the only thing that you can really identify and look at of what is that difference for this team. You look at the play of Kyria, you look at Zeus, who I think, yes, you can have these conversations. And we have talked about Zeus and Guma being those two that have kind of held on a little bit more than the others with Faker's absence. Seeing them play, seeing that turnaround in game one, for how badly things went for Zeus against that Gragas in the top side, to then 
burning it through on that rumble in game two is a major difference for this T1 team and absolutely one of the necessary things that you had to be able to have in the tank, in your back pocket, in your character to come through and be the victors on this day. And let's be honest, if you're looking head-to-head -head individual mid lane performance, BDD was probably better than Faker across the entirety of this five game set. But Faker is like that piece of gear that has that one enhancement that holds your entire build together. So when you remove it, the other four, oh, I don't have any of my special. I can't do anything without that piece. It's that one piece that has that passive that brings everything in your build together, makes it all synergize and pop off and be great. Yes, Faker is that guy, irreplaceable cannot find one for what he has done to this League of Legends scene for this T1 organization that is now moving on into the next tier of the LCK playoffs with, I will remind you, a nice little opportunity still available for them. Yeah, and they can lose KT into the loser's bracket. This is still, of course, that extended playoff bracket run. It's not right to the finals for T1. It's just round three. They're going to play, of course, the winner of Genji and Hanwha Life, but... Oh, I mean, I know people are going to be harsh and disappointed in KT. Five All-Pro team members, MVP of the split coaching staff. They had all these things going for them. They were so incredibly hyped up. And we said, this is too much hype for KT. T1, absolutely. We've seen, I mean, it's, this is only, what, four series Faker has played since he's been back. And each one has been a steep level up for the squad. And this is a team in T1 historically all kinds of different roster iterations it doesn't matter in the regular season they always seem to level up in playoffs and this is just another case in point for that and it looks much more like the T1 that was able to put together a better record throughout the spring split this past year than the one that started out this summer when you do even realize with Faker still not necessarily the most ultra impressive record that they were able to put forth. So this return to form and the way that they have ramped up from what they else they had shown even with Faker and Summer, that is the positives here for T1. I think this is more so about T1 returning to this type of level, this type of stratosphere uh, of play that we had KT at. And it is about KT fumbling and falling, which there still is room to talk about that. S good thing is though, and thankfully, we do have that safety bracket for uh, KT to fall down into in the loser situation. Yeah, and still, you know, obviously depends how Genji and Hanwha plays out. But KT, they weren't at their peak level, but you still saw glimpses. They were able to force this game five. There were still moments where you're confident in this team still being able to make a deep run, whether it's against Genji or Hanwha Life uh, in that loser's bracket. And they're still going to have plenty of championship points for the regional finals. But... We've been asking, waiting for T1 to get to this level to help bring up the power level of the LCK as a whole because it was such a two-horse race between KT and Genji for the entirety of the regular season. Even if it comes this late in playoffs, he's still going to bump up the whole region's level. It's, it's so necessary for just your outlook heading towards the World Championship because if you're only thinking about even no matter how well you think about Genji and KT Rolster, Heading up to against the Titanic LPL and looking at those four squads, they're rolling through this range of potential and skill that is there. You thought it was game over. You add in a T1. Maybe it's not enough that you're saying it's equal. Maybe it's not enough even to convince you that this is the way I'm going to be siding with. But it's enough that it raises that question that you have to have looking between these two teams, these regions that you would be going through. And we're very blessed have Baker leading the charge for T1 back into that category. It still feels like there's a bit of a mental block for KT. It's another game five loss to T1. I feel like the organization as a whole, not even these five players necessarily, has been suffering at the hands of T1 for so many years. It's something that's got to be deep and dark in the back of their brains. I, I actually kind of like this choice, though. Still, even losing this series to go against T1 with the maybe the mindset of, look, you're, uh, we're, if we're going to win this thing, we're going to have to run through Faker and T1. That is a requirement to make sure that you are clinching this LCK trophy. Get it out of the way now, and if we do lose, have enough faith and confidence in yourself to get back up there 
And if you do got to face T1 that is still hanging around in that winner's bracket, you have this experience. You have that opportunity to go, okay, this is what we're going to try different this time around. For KT Roaster, that might be just what it takes to get themselves that edge in the telecom war. And again, I, I got no real concerns that this loss has broken the mental of this KT squad. They were so friggin' good for the entirety of the regular season. And again, forcing that fifth game was huge for me to have a bounce back in game four because if they just got kind of wrecked three games in a row heading into the loser's bracket, maybe your mental state is a whole lot different if you're KT Rolster. But the bounce back in game four, and then you can look at the VOD of that game five and find avenues for KT to win that game. And hey, that's a, that is a 5-0 and Atrox for Zeus that is getting defeated in Game 4 is an important thing to keep track of for Keen. I think that was a very big bounce-back performance after you looked at how dominant he was Game 1, how dominated he got in Game 2, and still not getting that, uh, that you know, equation working the way that he wanted in Game 3. So to have that bounce-back in that crucial Game 4 to force that Game 5, I like that from KT. BDD already talked about him outplayed Faker individually in this matchup and was really the BDD of old, the one that is that type of threat to take over and be a problem in these games. You even look at as well, aiming in Lehens in the bottom lane. I think Lehens was doing a lot of great things, a lot of creative things in this game. If you're, t if you're looking for anything, I think Cuz was not quite as sharp. And that is one of those things where you look at, when I say that, that's not meant to be all too negative because he has been super sharp this year for KT Rolster, not quite as much in this series to be enough of an edge against T1. The T1 hype train rolls on the KT Rolster coaster. It hasn't fallen off. It just, it's on a downward trajectory. Oh, we're in way. maintenance. We're in maintenance. Yeah, right? we're, they're sitting there waiting. They, we got to fix this quickly. We got to bounce back for the very next round, but still have faith in KT in that loser's bracket run. T1, KT Telecom War. That's all great. But the real entree, the main course, is the summer finals of the North American Challengers, Challengers League. DSG disguised their first ever split. Completing, it's not a miracle run, but completing the incredibly impressive run through to finals to win the entire split. Toast spent his team's entire budget on having the team show up in a slick black Jeep. Oh, baby rolling in in style, disguised <laughs> toes. Oh, I love this story, dude. This is just actual, just genuine fun and excitement. Seeing this come through for disguised toes for these members of this team. This is what you want to talk about. These type of stories in the academy type of scene. This is good stuff. My brother, we see this team come through. We see the fans. They're there. They're loving it, too. Everyone's having a good time for Disguised Toast. It pays off bigger than you ever could have imagined stepping in when you did, Mr. Toast. And it's, you know, a dream scenario for Riot and the LCS because obviously this is, I'm just assuming, we don't have the numbers yet, but the most hyped up, most watched Challenger League finals that I can imagine in terms of audience in the actual studio and of course online views for the stream, seeing... Toast there with Shifter and Skara live viewing the whole thing, which is something he's been doing all season long. The players are getting amulets instead of trophies. Everyone gets their own little necklace. Okay, they, they kind of look like toys, but, you know, we'll take it. <laughs> and uh, aside from that, because the storyline so much here is Toast, Disguise, this new team in the Challenger scene, the new era. But how about these players? Guys like Zazel and Fake God, who everyone kind of said, hey, not really LCS caliber anymore. I guarantee you they're getting some calls from LCS teams so they're going to be on the big leagues next split. Yes, sir. And sometimes it is something like this, an opportunity, one of these crazy once in a lifetime type of things has to come through to change around perception, around players, what people are thinking. Because as you laid out, yes, these are players that I think a lot of people have said, we've seen your opportunity. We've seen your chance in the LCS and we deem it a big X. It's no, no, we're not bringing that back. All these type of things forgetting that yes there are room there are stories like this where you do bounce back you do find that drive you do work on it to get to these type of positions and i think a lot of the players on disguised toes do fit that type of label and when you see them find success like this to celebrate like this absolutely a feel-good moment there's no way at the start of the split disguised toast was even expecting to actually win 
the entire split, but somehow they put together this perfect combination of the veterans with Zazel and Fake God. And then guys like Meech, Young, Tomio, also probably all going to get promoted to the LCS next year. So who knows if this guy is going to do another year in Challenger or what the scene is going to be looking like. But it's probably going to be a whole new squad because these guys, deservedly so, should be getting attention and starting spots in the big league next year. My man, this is just the next stage. You ever play a franchise mode in one of those, you know, crappy sport video games? Here it is. This the is the next stage. Toast is playing it. He spent his mill to play with a team and <laughs> there it is. Now it's the rebuild phase, my man. You got your trophy, you got your championship. Let's see you build it back up from the ground up one more time. Yes, you mentioned the players. Very excited. I think a lot of them will be finding those LCS homes, hopefully, and we will be looking at them to continue that journey on that LCS stage. And for Disguised Toast, this kind of felt like the perfect storm, right? Everything going on, all that turmoil and everything else creating that lower value where Disguised Toast was able to buy in and make it possible. I hope that is still the opportunity that's going to be around because having something like Disguised Toast and hopefully maybe some of his other content creators seeing these type of things, you can start this type of little revolution, I think, in through the NA Academy that is influencing and, and bringing in all these eyeballs and attention to this Academy scene and very deservedly so. One other quick LCS immediate implication note from this series. It was Evil Genius's challenger, of course, the other squad in this one. Armeo started all the games, so, you know, making conclusions, assuming then it is going to be Shaden starting for the main roster in the LCS losers run against TL. Good to see. That is Evil Genius is putting that right foot forward, and I think right foot forward for both the Challengers team and the main team right now for the LCS. By the way, hilarious seeing the EG squad. Armeo, Smoothie, and King. <laughs> Love those challenger young talent up and coming, making it to finals, huh? Hey, I like to see Disguised Toast taking the edge there. It's one of the best ones for that. That's all I can say. Uh, but shout out again. EG, at least they still have an LCS uh, team that they're putting in that <laughs> academy scene. This all segues into the next bit to talk about because, well... We know how all this walkout stuff went. So many teams removing challenger teams entirely. That's the only reason we have a team like Disguise playing in this split. And now we're getting rumors. We already know TSM likely going wherever. Maybe the LPL, but not in the LCS. NRG already replaced CLG. Now we're hearing from Degon that there's another LCS team that has already sold their spot. Uh, Heavily rumored, seems like it's most likely Immortals, especially when you combine the fact that Immortals Gaming, the parent company, owns MIBR, which will likely be joining the CB Law. I'm pretty sure it's a conflict of interest to own a CB Law team and an LCS squad. So that's already potentially three teams that we're accustomed to seeing in the LCS. They're going to be gonzo for 2024. Going to be a different world, my man. We already knew this is gonna be excuse me i almost sneezed there it's gonna be the type of situation the allergic to immortals markets guys. <laughs> i'm allergic absolutely and but when you think about the type of landscape that we're gonna have in the lcs next year we knew that it was going to be different of course given the turmoil and everything that happened here knowing the tsm situation of course clg going out really fast as well this is that continuation of that type of slope that we are seeing in the change of the lcs landscape immortals I would love to have said, you know, oh, I would love to see them stick around type of thing. But this never really was that Immortals that we were promised that was returning to the LCS that was going to take over, going to be that type of team that where you had that excitement, you had those type of runs, the fans, everything else never, never came through in any of these iterations that Immortals put out on the LCS stage. And I feel like the most we so often, it was a two year, 2018 to 2019 is when Immortals left, you know. The debut when they had Hooney, Rain over, and then Cody Sun, they were all making deep runs in playoffs, sure. And then they leave for a couple years, come back, and yeah, it really never went together. We were always comparing Immortals and Golden Guardians because they were always sitting in that 9-10 spot in the LCS. And then what happens? These are the two biggest or lowest budget rosters in the LCS. And what happened the last two plus years for Golden Guardians? They've ascended to one of the best teams in the LCS. Yeah, and it really has been one of those differences. And the Golden Guardians is a fantastic example of that, where you would look at the schedule before and you'd go, oh, 
that's the game that I got to watch is, you know, IMT, whatever type of thing and everything else would fall around it. Whereas, as you said, Golden Guardians over the last couple of years, this split, you're looking at GG and you're going, OK, I'm getting a match that I want to watch. I want to pay attention to type of situation. Immortals never, never lived up to that hype, never really delivered upon it here and there brought in a player that you might say okay could change things up could be different never came fully through i don't think that a lot of lcs fans are going to be too upset too disappointed to see immortals go by the wayside and the other big difference between them and golden guardians is there was almost zero effort to grow a fan base for immortals there was no real content or way to showcase the players personalities that you could get behind golden guardians even when they weren't great, they were putting in effort to get the players more involved, to create content. And now you got the great stuff like they're rubbing an arrow's head for good luck because he's bald and all these other great things, hype up videos that they've done. So the transition over the last couple of years, just completely opposite ends of the spectrum, which is why I'm hoping and praying that a squad like GG is sticking around for 2024 and not going to be upset if it's Immortals that gets the boot. But these sweeping changes... I know we've kind of said before, it is an opportunity for the LCS to do a full rebuild and rebrand, whether it's, even if it's with less money, it's an opportunity to them for them to change for the better. Will they do that? Probably. Uh, not a ton of faith <laughs> in that type of situation coming through. You're right. It is absolutely possible that even on a smaller scale, smaller budget, whatever, you can still put together actually a better product for the LCS long-term, short-term and long-term actually with how things could go and what that focus could be on and what that commitment could look like from the teams, from these owners, would be the biggest thing that I would be kind of banking on for that LCS to have a little bit of a rebirth and emergence from the ashes of what we are going to be burning it down to at the end of this year. It's been so obvious and this split has made it even more so APA insanity coming over palafox having an incredible split all this young talent on disguised who just won the split what's the best way to have a budget roster it's investing in young rookies it's not importing washed up lck players who are getting close to a mill for a buyout it's investing in these young players and now the lcs due to these budget constraints might be forced into doing that and that's how you might end up with an actual better product and who knows Maybe the LCS teams are going to come down so much disguise will be able to buy one anyways. Oh, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me with something that I want to see happen so much at an LCS level. I, look, this is going to have to be an adjustment. We know that this adjustment is going to be coming for the LCS. I'm still of that opinion. Done correctly. Done with the right commitment. You can find success with whatever this rebuild of an LCS is going to look like. Just buckle up, folks, because it is going to be different. And we know that not everybody's a fan of different all the time right out of the gate. But just buckle yourself up and be prepared for it. But just imagine hanging in the LCS rafters, a Comic Sans scribbled DSG just by TSM and Cloud9 banners. Hey, would love it. Love it. Hey, just take the TSM spot even. Might be even <laughs> better poetic justice to move on through. See you later, Reggie. Incoming. Yeah. X out talk. those TSMs and just slap a yellow DSG banner right behind it. But either way, 2024 is going to be a very different looking LCS. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for watching as always. And we will catch you on that flippity flip.